So in a sense, this is, a, I think, looking at the, uh, the, the spectrum of papers um, in the conference, this is probably a slightly different one. Maybe my, the colleague, my colleague that will follow me is also in that category of trying to get beneath, if you like, into the guts of uh, what happens in the labor market when you think about inclusive growth. And it's a paper essentially that tries to tell uh, three types of stories uh, for a country that you all hopefully will know for pretty well, but just in case you're not sure, South Africa is sort of an upper middle income country, a uh, population of about 50 million, similar to South Korea. Um, the one that's important in this context is probably one of the highest unemployment rates in the world. Um, uh, if you use the ILO definition at about 25%, uh, and a growth, if you like, poverty dynamic that's very clear since apartheid ended in 94, which has shown modest, depending on the time period and depending on the data set and the variables you use, either a reduction, marginal reduction in poverty or absolutely no change in poverty or the poverty gap uh, independent of the, the measure as well. But then, without a doubt, uh, an increase and a significant increase in inequality, again, uh, uh, invariant to the measure that you use. Um, but what interests us in this paper was what it is that explains this change, if you like, at the level of the labor market. Uh, and in particular, we wanted to look if, and see if you could update our a sort of earlier work on 1970 to 94 and see if there was a skills bias story in terms of our employment trajectory and then secondly whether that was explained by specific factors. So we start out, it's sort of a three-part paper uh, in search of some unity which is not quite there yet, it'll be very clear to you, uh, and the three parts involve a descriptive overview and we're particularly interested in looking at the changing structure of the economy in terms of employment shares by sector and skill. We use the de decomposition technique then to ask uh, the question around the nature of these shift, whether, shifts, whether they've been skills biased in nature and also whether within or between sector shifts explain those changes. And that's the standard sort of Katz and Murphy decomposition. And then we go one step further uh, and try and link up to the auto literature now which has switched away ironically from this occupation focus to a task-based measure. Uh, looking rather at different tasks uh, linked to occupations uh, with the notion that these tasks and the wage returns to these tasks may actually explain dynamics related to things such as outsourcing, uh, declines in the middle of the distribution in terms of uh, wages and so on. Uh, and I guess underlying all of this is our, our continuous lessons for inclusive growth. So we used our, our, our labor force surveys for South Africa, which were biannual, until 2007, and then the quarterly labor force surveys. We switch between them depending on whether we have and need wage data. I'm happy to talk about the details of which data set we used and why, but essentially uh, we don't have wages for every single year, uh, and uh, when, we, when we do the returns analysis, we can only go up to 2011. So some of the quick early descriptive statistics, the first part of the presentation. Just a standard story, the lines are more interesting. You can see the collapse in employment and GDP. It's South Africa's first three-quarter recession since 94. So we had you know, over 70 quarters of positive economic growth, and then you see the recession striking, um, and it's very clear. Um, what is not clear from the figure is that the jobs lost in that period in the sort of third quarter of 2008 to second, up to the second quarter of 2009, those jobs lost have not yet been regained in pure quantity terms uh, following the recession. Um, the simple elasticity before the recession, the output elasticity was 0.64, uh, and after the recession it's minus 0.16, uh, and that's indicative of this inability to recover. Um, we thought we'd stick this in, it's actually not in the paper, but just to give you a sense of some of the structural changes you're seeing uh, and you've seen over a very short period, that's 1993 uh, over there and uh, uh, 2012 using just simple shares of GDP, uh, real GDP over the post-apartheid period and the big story here is financial and business services from 17% to 24% of GDP and that's a, that's, that's a big change over a short period. Uh, and partly explained by mining share, which goes from 11 to 6%. Um, agriculture is important, and we'll see for another reason, but it's not a GDP story, but you see constant shares of GDP for agriculture over the period. It's important in our employment story. So if you did um, what we call our bubble graphs within the DPRU, um, these sort of average value added changes by employment, 
Um, the size of the, the circle tells you the share of employment and total employment. It's very clear what's happening. You've seen job destruction and output destruction in the mining industry, right? So you've seen a decline in, uh, in both average annual employment and gross value added. In agriculture, you've seen a decline in employment, but amidst growing value added over the period. And we'll talk about the exogenous policy shock, but it's essentially the minimum wage in agriculture that causes that, uh, that uh, employment loss. For the rest, what you see is fairly uh, tepid employment growth over the period across all other sectors, um, with financial services probably being the, the, the big performer. So a little bit more into the guts of the employment shifts. You've got those relative changes, which is simply um, uh, uh, the, the percentage change in employment by that sector uh, relative to the percentage change in employment in total. So any number above one shows a faster relative growth in employment, and you can see the green rectangle tells you what, where, where most of the growth has been, right? So within financial and business services and community services, which is 80% the public sector, is where you see most of the growth in employment. Uh, losses in employment have been in agriculture, uh, which we've spoken about, and then mining, right? And uh, a sort of inclusive growth story, which uh, I'm sure uh, Eric and uh, Machiko know very well about, is in the East Asian sense, for example, would be a fast-growing light manufacturing sector. And it's very clear in the South African context you haven't seen this. So you see a manufacturing employment growth, a relative employment growth of 0.3%. Um, and, and there the, are the lots of other interesting stories in there, but essentially uh, one which is of employment shifts of a rapid growth in the public sector. Uh, financial and business services, which has a statistical anomaly uh, embedded in there are temporary employment service providers. Again, we don't have time to get into it. A large proportion of whom are security workers that are driving um, uh, this because of uh, business services. Um, and essentially job destruction in the primary sectors. At the skills level, uh, you've got uh, medium-skilled employment uh, uh, declines in the primary sector. So if you look, if, you, if, we, if we do the, rather do the sector uh, occupation or the sector skill cells, you see job destruction in the primary sector for medium-skilled workers, same with the secondary sector, right? And in a sense, that's where we start thinking, well, if it's medium-skilled workers in manufacturing, for example, is there something going on about outsourcing of these jobs? Is there something about automation, uh, foreign competition, and so on, that's causing this uh, deterioration in employment uh, in, in, in that particular skills category? So we then, um, we then uh, try and add a bit more substance to it in the second part of the paper by, by doing the standard decomposition. Um, which in the literature divides employment shifts or relative labor demand shifts, uh, divides them into sort of being driven by two forces. One is a within sector shift. So you'll see technological change. Uh, the relative price of uh, capital and labor will shift um, uh, and, and so on, causing employment choices to change within the firm, right? Uh, there's also one which is not mentioned ever in, in any of this literature because it's developed country focused, is exogenous policy shocks. So a sectoral minimum wage, right, is a within-sector shift that can cause substantive changes to employment. And we actually see that happening in, 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 in agriculture. Um, Between-sector shifts are those driven by changing uh, uh, preferences, taste for products, uh, and also, uh, crucially, global competition and trade flows. And so the question then is, in this methodology, is which of the two forces are actually more important in identifying your changing preferences for certain occupations? So the Katz and Murphy decomposition is a very simple one. That's the aggregate uh, uh, shift. You get the between sector shift when you subscript by sector, and then the within is the difference between the two. Um, sort of fairly standard sort of Excel spreadsheet driven um, estimation. When you do it, for South Africa for the 2001 to 2012 period, which we've done, as I say, for the long run from 1970 to 95, we then updated. We can do it from 94 to 2012, but we thought we'd, we'd control for data changes uh, from 2000 onwards. Um, and working with the LFSs, you see, I guess the, the, probably the most interesting result is the last column, which is the share of the relative employment shift in those skills categories explained by technology or within sector shifts, or as the case may be, an exogenous policy shock. And you see overwhelmingly 
our relative uh, preference for skilled versus unskilled or, or medium skilled workers uh, has been influenced by within sector forces at, uh, um, uh, at the firm level. So in the case of managers and professionals, that relative increase in the demand, which is this, uh, let me just get the cursor, which is that 13 and 17 percent, right, has been overwhelmingly driven by changes within firms, changes related to technology, related to changes of uh, capital and labor prices, uh, and so on. Here's the, if I could just, yeah, that is that minus 20.47 is the rapid reduction. We've done um, sort of classic Card and Kruger work. Ben and I have done it on the sort of impact of the minimum wage in agriculture, and you see the massive reduction in employment in agriculture. That's, that, this is the other side of the story saying that this is the exogenous policy shock that caused this relative uh, employment destruction uh, amongst farm workers um, 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 over the period. Uh, the minimum wage was instituted, I think, in 2003, um, and so it's a nice period to pick up that employment loss. Um, there's some evidence of between-sector shifts, particularly in the case of the mining industry. So you get, a, you get a, a, rather than a dominant within-sector um, uh, share, you get some action, if you like, on the between-sector side when you look at unskilled workers, and that's partly this changing shares in output for the mining industry. So... Um, part of this part, part of this literature then, then, then stops, if you like, in, in the 2000s, and, 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 and they tell a nice story about skills bias, technical change, and we think we can tell that story for South Africa, that part of the reason you haven't seen inclusive growth, part of the reason, uh, if you like, that you haven't seen these rising, uh, part of the reason you have seen these rising genies is because of what's happened to the skills profile of this economy. So you've got, uh, just to close it off, outside of the intestines of the estimates, you've got these uh, you've got a high unemployment excess labor supply economy and you've got a skills biased or a labor demand trajectory that's heavily uh, biased in favor of skilled workers. And so all that does is stretch that wage distribution um, because of the shortages and because of the nature of the labor demand uh, that you see and the majority of which is being driven by within sector, uh, within sector shifts. How much time do I have, Louis? So, in a sense, that's the uh, that, that's that's where the, the, the sort of the, the in terms of the, the techniques that you use and the methodology, that's where the literature sort of stops. Uh, there, there has now, since then, been very recent work by Orta um, uh, Asimoglu on, on the theory side, and then Goose and Manning, uh, and then the paper that we actually use but we didn't quote is, is the Lemu paper, Fortin and Lemu, in which they. The, their starting point is to say the following, that they've observed, if you like, in, in, uh, in North American wage distributions, this sort of uh, non-linear, right, uh, but, 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 but a decline in wages in the middle of the distribution. So you have something uh, that's very specific across, I think it's between 1980 and 2000s. Um, they then propose, and partly driven by the data they have access to, that routine-based tasks... So tasks that are easily automated, that can easily be uh, routined, are easily offshoreable, are easily exported to other countries. And so the demand for, and if you think of software engineers in India, right, the demand for those occupations with those types of tasks actually has fallen in the U.S., and so you see a hollowing out of the middle. And there's this broader discussion about the missing middle in the wage distribution and so on. But it's, it's driven by this auto and levy view, I think, essentially, uh, that you have uh, wages that are responding because of the nature of tasks that are easily uh, outsourced to other countries. Um, and, and that's their starting point, that in the threat of sort of international cheap competitors has forced uh, production lines, and I'm sure there's an industrial policy equivalent of that, but parts of the production process can actually be outsourced. But you can't get at that production process without looking... Or, or by looking at occupations, but you can get at it by looking at tasks, right? And what they have, which unfortunately we don't quite have, is a, uh, uh, Ben's looked at this in more detail, a data set which, which lines up occupation against specific tasks. So if you think of a job, uh, jobs would have different types of, um, sorry, it's a lot to read, but rather read the bowl. They would have different types of tasks in an occupation. So an occupation will have an ICT-type component. It will have a routine or automation-type component. Uh, 
face-to-face -face components or tasks, on-site tasks, and decision-making or analytic tasks. So in a way, the argument they make is that some jobs, right? So if you think of, uh, if you think of an ICT type job, right? That's clearly a computer program or a software engineer. Or even if you think of routine type jobs like textile weavers, right? Machine operators, assemblers. Those kinds of occupations which predominate, uh, predominantly have those forms of tasks are easily offshoreable. And if they're offshoreable, they're going to have specific impacts on the distribution of income, on labor market outcomes, on demand and supply, and so on. Right? Um, and so the search is really for trying to see or estimate whether you see these kinds of outcomes. They have really detailed data. Um, they, they have more than these five categories, uh, and they have it by, I think it's at a very granular occupational level. We don't have that kind of data, uh, and so we, all we did uh, in, the, in the paper is actually to, to accrue and create task categories by occupation. And so we went through um, the four-digit level of the ISOC that's in the Labor Force Survey, so, and then assigned what we thought based on, you know, if it was a software program and so on, well, based on what we thought would be the predominant tasks, uh, and, and that's available for every, everybody to look at and, and, and critique. But in a sense, our question is, to what extent do you see changing returns, right, to these tasks uh, across the time period? Do we find, for example, evidence that routine-based tasks or automated tasks uh, have been facing global competition and therefore you see a reduction in... Uh, in returns. Uh, I only have five minutes, but in a sense, these are the tasks, and across the occupations, you can see how you can align different tasks to different occupations. Note that there are more tasks than there are occupations, because each occupation will have more than one task aligned to it. Just a little bit about what you can see going on, say, for 2001, you'll see that uh, in, in agriculture, right, the majority of tasks involved in agriculture would be automated type tasks or uh, uh, in, in manufacturing, uh, the majority of uh, tasks in manufacturing will be automated. And so in a sense, if we take the automotive kind of tasks, those are the ones according to uh, at least the global literature or the North American literature would suggest that that's the task that's most prone to global competition because it can be easily, sorry, it can be easily outsourced. So all we do is we, we uh, take a quantile regression approach, so we go across the distribution and we estimate the, the coefficient and our regression is not there. So the, the regression should be below, uh, it's disappeared. But essentially it's a quantile regression with our standard controls, so we have the you know, age, gender, union controls, uh, no we don't have union, but uh, experience and so on. And then instead of the occupation uh, dummy, what we have are these these task uh, dummies, right? So an individual will be assigned a task and then we measure the coefficient on the basis of the, uh, the, dis the distribution that you're measuring at the particular quantile. And so this is the third last slide, but this is essentially a key result. Uh, it's, I haven't seen it done for any developing country, um, and I'm sure um, uh, it'd be great to sort of see if we can tell similar stories for other parts of the world. But let's take the automation one. So these are your quantiles, uh, so these are the, the coefficients on the automation dummy across the quantile uh, distribution, right? So from the first quantile to the 90th quantile, and these are the wage returns, right? But you'll see that between 2001 and 2011, there's actually been a decline in the return. I'll come back to the bottom end of the distribution. But from sort of the 20th percentile right upwards, you've seen a decline across all the percentiles in the returns to automotive tasks. In a sense, for us, that tells us that you've seen this, because of foreign competition, you've seen this offshoring of jobs, right, that are easily autom automated. Um, two more minutes, okay. And uh, just very quickly, so for example, in the face-to-face, -face, that would be um, predominantly jobs that are either sort of in financial services or in the public sector where you have to engage with individuals, uh, you're seeing an, actually an increase across the quantiles. Um, just very quickly, for ICT, we don't see a result that you see in North America because most of your ICT jobs in South Africa, uh, or at least in the developing country context like South Africa, are in financial services and the public sector. And in fact, for various reasons, you've actually seen an increase in the returns to wages across the distribution there. Just very quickly, at the bottom end, what's going on, and it's an important part of the story, 
is strong trade union uh, involvement in collective bargaining that pushes the bottom end up, as well as, um, as well as minimum wage intervention in certain sectors. So very quickly, our conclusions on employment. Uh, most of the employment growth has been driven by uh, pre-crisis uh, employment growth. We see agriculture, the impact of minimum wages is key to the employment collapse. There's another story, another paper there. But mining loses jobs uh, at a rapid rate for various reasons, which I can discuss. Um, very little growth in employment in manufacturing. And that's, that's, an, a lack, that's an exclusive or a lack of an inclusive growth story, which I think is important to inject into, uh, into broad discussions. Uh, <laughs> and then finally, that's, those are the conclusions on wages, which you can uh, 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 read yourself. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thanks very much.